Hi guys, it's me, Professor D. And welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be going over the musculoskeletal system. It's going to be in the form of Kahoot, as you can see. But before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel. You can do that by liking this video. You're going to love it. Press that like button now so you don't forget. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. And don't forget to press that red notification bell so you'll be notified every single time a new video is released. Also, don't forget, I'm now offering next generation NCLEX reviews and one-on-one -on -one consultation or tutoring sessions. You can reserve your spot right now by going to my website, www.nexusnursinginstitute.com. While you're there, be sure to check out the audio lessons I have available. Last but not least, don't forget, almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of uh, nursing topics on my other social media platforms, such as TikTok. Instagram and Facebook. So be, for, be sure to check that out. All right, guys, without any further ado, let's get started. Musculoskeletal disorders. Who's at highest risk for developing osteoporosis? Would you say a 45 year old jogger, a 32 year old asthmatic, an 80 year old alcoholic, or a 65 year old smoker? Who do you think is at the highest risk for developing osteoporosis? That's right. The smoker. The smoker. Smoking is never, ever, ever, ever good. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices, the jogger. Well, when you're jogging, that's a type of weight-bearing exercise, right? Weight-bearing exercises are wonderful for the bones because it pushes the calcium that was hanging out in the bloodstream to go back into the bones and make the bones stronger. So that's a good thing. You're 32 asthmatic. If I didn't have the smoker there, I would have considered the asthmatic. And the reason for that is we know that with asthma, many patients who um, have um, asthma, they may possibly be on steroids. And we know that long-term steroid use can cause osteoporosis. But when you're between those two and an out, uh, excuse me, a smoker, it's going to be the smoker all the way. And then you have an alcoholic. Excessive alcohol use also is a risk factor for osteoporosis. But even with the alcohol, when you're between the alcohol and the smoking, it's going to be a smoker that is at highest risk. Um, before I move on, I want to talk to you guys about this also. So let's talk about other risk factors. Um, the gender, being a female, being a woman is going to place you at higher risk than being a male. And let me be more specific. Not only being a female, but you're even at higher risk than that if you're of Asian descent. If you have a small um, frame, you're at high risk for osteoporosis. If you're a couch potato, you're not moving around. There's decreased circulation. Um, you're at higher risk for osteoporosis if you have a low intake of uh, calcium, because remember, calcium is what makes um, the bone strong. And of course, long-term use of steroids can also cause osteoporosis. So it's very important that you guys know the risk factors. You're caring for a fresh post-op patient. They had a knee arthroscopy. Which statement would reflect understanding of your post-op teaching regarding that knee arthroscopy? Would it be, I can go back to regular exercise in 48 hours. I'll, repain, I'll remain NPO until 24 hours has passed. I'll stay off the leg entirely for the next eight hours or I will report any increased pain, fever, or swelling. What do you guys think the answer is? That's right. The last one, I will report any increased pain, fever, or uh, swelling. And I want you to notice, what did I put in front of pain, fever, swelling? Increase. Patient just had surgery. They had an invasive procedure. It's painful. They may have pain, but increased pain, that lets you know that whatever we're doing for the, our patient, that evidence-based practice has shown sh that should help alleviate this issue, such as giving analgesics, is not working. Something's going on, right? Increased pain, Fever, swelling, fever, and swelling, those are signs of what? Infection. 
when a patient has surgery, I don't care what type of surgery it is. I don't care if it's arthroscopy. I don't care if it's a, um, a, um, amputation, whatever, if it was invasive, we're always going to be concerned about these three things. We're going to be concerned about hemorrhage, them bleeding out. We're going to be concerned about them developing a clot and that clot moving, possibly going to the lungs, developing a pulmonary embolism. And the third thing, we're going to be concerned about infection, right? So we're going to be looking out for inflammation, pain, redness, mucopurulent drainage, foul odor, you know, uh, uh, increased WBCs, all of those signs and symptoms of infection. By the way, um, let's look at... Let's go over the wrong answer choices. I'll tell you what I want to say. I can go back to regular exercise in 48 hours. No, you can't. No, you can't. Matter of fact, you just had surgery. You're going to have numbness in that area. Once that numbness wears off with the use of an assistive device, such as, you know, a cane or whatever assistive device, you can get up to go you know, to the bathroom and for short walks, but you have to wait for the numbness to subside. But regular exercise, you're not going to go back to regular exercise for uh, at least a week after you've had that knee arthroscopy. I'll remain NPO until 24 hours has passed. No, after the patient's NPO before surgery, right? After surgery, we need to make sure they have bowel sounds. We need to make sure that they've passed gas and then they can have a regular diet. Um, I'll stay off the leg entirely for the next eight hours. That's not necessary. We want the patient to be walking around because we don't want them to develop a clot, right? We don't want them to develop infection. We want them moving around, but we have to make sure that they have feeling in their leg and we're going to assist them. We're not going to let them try to get up by themselves because we want to avoid a fall. So the correct answer, we're going to be watching out for those signs and symptoms of infection. How are you guys doing on the live? Okay, good. Let's go. You witness a biker get struck by a truck. You suspect a leg fracture. Which action would be best to perform at this time? Would you manually manipulate the fracture to reduce it? Would you help the biker get up and sit on the sidewalk? Would you leave the biker to go call for help? Or would you remain with the biker and encourage them to stay still? What do you think is the best thing to do? Very good. The correct answer is stay with them. This patient is in trouble. You are not going to leave them. You're going to stay with them and you're going to encourage them to stay still. And the reason we're encouraging them to stay still is because we suspect that there's a fracture. When there's a fracture, you want to do what? Immobilize that area. You don't want um, more damage to be caused to the tissue. So you're going to immobilize it, have them stay still, and you're going to stay with them. Okay, this is a select all that applies. Your patient has a new cast applied to their arm. Which instructions should you provide to them? Here are your choices. Keep the ca cast clean and dry. Expect numbness, tingling, pallor. Use a hair dryer set on hot if pruritus occurs. Keep the casted extremity elevated. Allow the cast a few days to dry. For itching, use a thin object to scratch the area such as a ruler. What do you guys think? Okay, you guys didn't do too well on this. Let's talk about it. Here's the correct answer. You're going to tell them to keep the cast clean and dry. We don't want any bacteria, any pathogens to start to set in. We want to preserve the integrity of the skin underneath the cast. So we want it clean and dry. We're going to tell them to keep the casted extremity elevated. Why are we keeping that casted extremity elevated? What we don't want is the formation of edema. Remember, the cast, it cannot expand. So imagine if that casted extremity starts to become edematous. 
but the cast is not expanding. What can possibly happen? Compartment syndrome, which is a medical emergency. So we want to keep it, the, we want to keep that extremity elevated so we can decrease the swelling. And we also want to allow the cast a few days to dry and to be more specific, it'll take around 24 to 72 hours for it to completely dry. And that is very important. Um, some things I want to bring to your attention that you also need to know these turn up as uh, test questions as well. When handling the cast, you handle the cast with what? Your palms and never your fingers. Why? You don't want to cause indentations that can cause pressure on the skin and tissues. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. Expect, expecting numbness, tingling, and pallor. Absolutely not. You do not expect a numbness, tingling, pallor. Matter of fact, you teach the patient, if they experience any of these, they have to report it right away because these may be signs of compartment syndrome. Next, I saw this on the live. A lot of you guys on the live typed in hair dryer. Absolutely not. You saw hot hair dryer and you thought it was the correct answer, but look what I said. I wrote hot. If the patient's experiencing pruritus, so it's itchy, right? You can help to relieve that itch by using a hair dryer, but the hair dryer has to be on what setting? Cool. Never hot, right? So that, that's what makes it wrong. You got to read closely because that's how NCLEX will get you too. They'll give you one word and you'll think it's so beautiful. You want to choose an answer, but the whole thing has to be right. If the whole thing is not right, the whole thing is what? Incorrect. And last, for itching, use a thin object to scratch the area such as a ruler. Seven people chose this. Absolutely not. You do not stick anything down that cast. You don't stick a hanger. You don't stick a pen. You don't stick a ruler. You don't stick anything, okay? You stick something down that cast to scratch your skin, that skin, may, skin can open up. And remember, your skin is the first line of defense against infection. Bacteria sets in and boom, now the patient's got a bacterial infection or they got a skin infection. Absolutely not, okay? True or false? Patients with gout should be on a high purine diet. Is this true or is this false? What do you think? <coughs> Excuse me. Patients with gout, should they be on a high purine diet? That's false. That's false. They need to be on a low purine diet, guys. You know that people with gout, they don't met, uh, metabolize purines appropriately. Okay, so then you got all these um, uric acid crystals depositing in the joints and the tissues of the patient, causing pain and inflammation. Guys, I'm not going to add you to my life. I'm teaching. <laughs> Stop asking. So anyway, the gout, um, the uric acids will lodge in, you know, the tissues and in those joints. So absolutely not. It's the opposite. Patients with gout, they need to be on a low purine diet. Select all that applies. What should you teach your patient with gout to avoid? Select all that applies. Your patient has gout. What are you going to teach them to avoid, to stay away from? Here are choices. Alcohol, green beans, organ meats, broccoli, aged cheeses, and water. This is select all that applies. Um, it's more than one answer. What are you going to teach them to avoid? Okay, what they need to stay away from is alcohol, organ meats, and aged cheeses. So very good. They need to avoid those. Um, the patient actually needs to um, eat foods that have a higher pH, more alkalinic foods, such as what? Green beans, broccoli, 
right? I just talked to you guys about those uric acid crystals that lodges themselves in those joints and tissues. So the patient needs to eat foods that are more alkalinic. Why do we have water on here? Why is water important? So the patient um, uh, can decrease their risk of uh, getting stones. They're at high risk for stones, the patient with gout. So they need to drink lots of water and eat more alkalinic foods. Stay away from organ meats such as liver, alcohol, and aged cheeses. Anything that's high in purine, stay away from them. You're assessing your patient in skeletal traction. Which will be most concerning about the pin sites? Would it be redness, pain, thick yellow drainage, or clear watery drainage? Your patient is in skeletal traction and you're assessing them. What would be most concerning to you about the pin sites? Would it be redness, pain, thick yellow drainage, or clear watery drain drainage? You know, I can't speak, guys. Yep. Thick yellow drainage. So think about it. They're in skeletal traction. They had surgery. We expect some amount of redness. They just had surgery. We expect some amount of pain. We expect some amount of drainage, not excessive, but we do expect some amount. But thick yellow drainage, that's what? Purulent drainage. What is purulent drainage? What does purulent drainage tell us? Infection. Let me go back to the speech I told you before. Any patient that had surgery, it does not matter what type of surgery they had. We're always going to be concerned about hemorrhage and bleeding out. So you can be watching out for those signs and symptoms of hemorrhage, such as decreased blood pressure, increased heart rate, increased respirations, decreased urine output, uh, decreased RBCs, all those signs and symptoms of them bleeding out. Most of the test questions are going to be as direct and tell you hemorrhage. They're going to give you those signs and symptoms, and you're expected to understand that most likely that's what's happening. What else are we going to be concerned about? That patient developing a, a DVT or clot, them having that um, one-sided pain, maybe in the calf, right? God forbid that clot dislodges and goes to the patient's heart, patient, uh, goes to their heart, goes to their lungs. They have shortness of breath, a dyspnea. And last, I gave you hemorrhage. I gave you DVT, PE. What's the third one? Oh, infection, duh. So we're going to be looking again for increased WBCs, mucopurulent drainage, foul odor, inflammation, all of those signs and symptoms of infection. Your patient has a cast on the lower leg. Which would indicate infection? Oh, I just gave you guys the answer. So which would indicate infection? Would it be dependent edema? Would it be diminished distal pulse? Would it be the presence of a hot spot on the cast? Or would it be pallor and edema of the casted leg? Oh, I did not give you the answer. Good. What do you think would be a sign and symptom of infection? Edema, distal pulse, hot spot on the cast, or pallor and edema of the leg? Very good, hot spot. What do you think is causing a hot spot on the cast? Heat, that heat coming from what? Infection. That's what we're gonna be concerned about. You see the other choices, that patient having um, uh, edema or pallor or even diminished distal pedal pulses, those are not good, but they're not signs and symptoms of infection. They're actually signs and symptoms of decreased circulation. So when you see those type of options, you should be thinking about decreased circulation. But when you see heat, redness, inflammation, um, increased temperature, foul odor, um, mucopurulent drainage, things like that, you should be thinking of infection. Which, which systemic disorder causes the destruction of connective tissue and synovial membrane within the joint? Is it gout, osteoporosis, compartment syndrome, or rheumatoid arthritis? Yep. 
rheumatoid arthritis. And that's exactly what's happening. And so the patient will have inflammation of those joints and even deformities of the joint. They're going to have pain. They're going to have a uh, tenderness. They're going to have uh, um, uh, that achiness in those joints, especially when they wake up in the morning. That's when it's going to be the worst. Select all that applies, which is not a clinical manifestation of rheumatoid arthritis. Select all that applies. So you're looking for signs and symptoms that are not associated with rheumatoid arthritis. Here are your choices. Joint stiffness, joint deformities, elevated ESR, ESR's erythrocyte sedimentation rate, normal x-ray of the affected area, decreased ESR, low grade temperature and weakness which are not clinical manifestations of rheumatoid arthritis. And it's more than one answer. This is a select all that applies. Okay, and the two answers are normal x-ray. You do not expect to see a normal x-ray on um, a patient who has rheumatoid arthritis. You expect to see some deformities on the x-ray and you don't expect to see decreased ESR. Whenever we're talking about ESR, when the ESR is increased, it lets you know there's inflammation present. And I already told you that patient that has rheumatoid arthritis ends in itis, hello, itis means what? Inflammation of... So you know there's inflammation, so we expect that ESR to be increased. In rheumatoid arthritis, we expect to see joint stiffness, joint deformities, elevated ESRs, and we also expect to see the patient have a low uh, grade, they may have a low grade temperature and weakness, especially in the affected joints. True or false? Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disorder. Is this true or is this false? Very good. It's true. What does the word autoimmune mean? That means the body is attacking itself. This disorder, this illness is not coming from the outside. It's coming from the body. What happens is this person's own body is attacking itself. So their own immune system is attacking the tissues and the joints. And that's what's causing the pain and inflammation that we see. You have a patient with a cast. You've rested their extremity. You've given them pain meds as ordered, but they're still in pain. What do you suspect to be happening? Infection, anxiety, impaired circulation, or they have another fracture? Very good. Impaired circulation. What is um, the phrase we're thinking of? And it starts with a C. Do you guys know what that is? Put There we go, compartment syndrome. That's what we're suspecting. They have a cast, which means that they have a broken bone. So they're going to have some pain. We're going to medicate them as ordered for the pain. We're going to give them analgesics. We're going to give them the type and amount that we know evidence-based practice has shown us should decrease the pain. So we've done what we were supposed to do and that pain hasn't decreased. And we've elevated the extremity to decrease, you know, uh, uh, the swelling and they're still in pain. Yeah. You better suspect decreased circulation, possible compartment syndrome. True or false? When going up the stairs, the patient that's on crutches should move the unaffected extremity first. Is this true or is this false? Your patient is on crutches and they have to go up the stairs. 
You're going to teach them to move the unaffected extremity first. Is this true or is this false? Very good, it's true. How do you remember this? Good goes to heaven, right? So if you're going up as if you're going to heaven, you're gonna start on the good leg. But if you were going downstairs, right? Where's hell? Hell is down, right? So bad goes to hell. If you're going downstairs with crutches, you're going to start on the bad leg, on the affected leg. So upstairs, unaffected leg, but downstairs, affected leg, okay? For crutches, the distance between the axilla and the arm piece should be how many finger widths in the axilla space? Is it one to two? Is it two to three? Is it three to four? Or is it four to five? What do you guys think? All right, guys, so you wanted two to three finger breaths um, between your axilla and the top where you're resting it. You do not want to rest the axilla directly on the crutches. There has to be that space, okay? Last question, guys, and this is a select all that applies. What are the possible complications of a fracture? Select all that applies. What can possibly happen to the patient that has a fracture? Here are your choices. Fat embolism, compartment syndrome, infection, pulmonary embolism, hemorrhage, osteomyelitis. What are the possible complications of a fracture? Again, fat embolism, Compartment syndrome, infection, pulmonary embolism, hemorrhage, osteomyelitis. And this is a select all that applies. There's more than one answer. That's right. Very good. All of them. All of these are possible complications. Fat embolism, especially if the fracture was in a long bone, because we know those fat uh, goblets. Am I pronouncing that right? Globlets? Goblet. Guys, on the live, is it goblet or globlet? I'm having a brain fart. Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. So the, those fat globlets like to hang out in the long bones. So if it breaks, when you, where do you think they're going to go? So an, an embolism and is any, you know, foreign body, foreign material that is moving in the, I can't say foreign because clots are part of your body, but it shouldn't be there. And it's actually moving. Once it's moving, it's an embolism. But anyway, fat and um, the fat, they love hanging out in the long bones. So the patient's at risk for fat embolism, especially if it was a long bone that broke. Compartment syndrome, you guys know the patient's going to be at risk for compartment syndrome, that pressure that's being exerted against the tissues, against the nerves, against the muscles, decreased circulation. Infection, of course, the patient's going to be at risk for infection with a broken bone. Pulmonary embolism, that embolism going, um, um, the emboli going to the patient's lungs, causing a PE. Hemorrhage, yep, the patient can have internal bleeding. And of course, osteomyelitis, which is a type of infection. It's infection of the bone. So the patient's not only at risk for infection, more specifically, they're at also at risk for infection of the bone, osteomyelitis. You guys did a wonderful job. Okay, guys, thank you for watching. Please let me know what you thought about this video. Let me know what you'd like to see me cover next. And let me know what format you'd like to see it in. Do you want it in Kahoot? Do you want it in a lesson where I'm teaching out of the book? Or do you want it in a Q&A, such as those videos that are released at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every Sunday? Once again, don't forget, if you want to book your spot now for a uh, Next Generation NCLEX review, or maybe you need some help, you want some one-on-one -on -one attention, you need some tutoring, you can reserve 
reserve your spot by going to nexusnursinginstitute.com. And while you're there, be sure to check out the audio lessons available. Almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics on my other social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video and you guys will catch me on the next video.